Okay, so uh, welcome uh, everybody to the uh, online seminar series Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. We have the pleasure today to have uh, Andrea Lodi. He's uh, Andrew and Antish uh, professor at the Jacobs uh, Technion uh, Cornell Institute at Cornell University. He has a PhD in System Engineering from uh, 2000 from uh, the University of Bologna. And um, after becoming, um, um, say, um, walking through the whole uh, academic ladder and becoming full professor there, he moved to uh, Canada and he took the excellent chair, research chair in data science uh, for real time decision making uh, at the Polytechnic from Montreal. And um, he is now uh, in, at Cornell University. He has also been a consultant uh, for um, the CIPLEX uh, R&D team at IBM. Uh, he has received uh, numerous uh, prizes uh, from the community. And the latest ones, as far as I'm aware of, is the Farkas Award for his contributions to the field of optimization. So that basically tells you, you know, that we are having today uh, uh, the pleasure of having a leading academic in the area of combinatorial optimization and nonlinear uh, programming, and that he has uh, done extensive work in different applications, energy transport, health production, etc. But uh, also uh, within the field of machine learning, and we are extremely happy to have you uh, here. I'm not going to count your number of publications. I'm not going to count your uh, <laughs> many other things. Because that will be, uh, yeah, uh, as we all know, you are uh, a leading expert in the field, and we are extremely happy that you found the time today to, to come and talk to us. Thank you very much, Andrea. You have, uh, say, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Uh, take your time, and then at the end, we will, uh, we will have the questions. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the nice invitation and the nice presentation. I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be a kind of ear, whatever that means, in these conditions. And uh, uh, again, so I hope to be able to meet uh, many of you in person uh, uh, relatively soon. Things are uh, moving in the, I will say, in the right direction. So. Uh, what I will talk about today is uh, um, my re most recent work on, um, let's say, try to look at uh, heuristics for mixed integer optimization through a machine learning lens. And uh, this is uh, um, the outline of my talk. So I will uh, try to convince you that primal heuristics play a central role in exact solvers for mixed integer uh, programming. Uh, and um, uh, essentially for two main reasons. So the first one is that, of course, uh, the, on the one hand, uh, uh, having a primal solutions uh, helps uh, speeding up the branch and bound framework. Uh, and uh, on the one, uh, because of fathoming nodes. And on the other uh, side, uh, so the idea is that uh, if you don't have enough time uh, in uh, for for essentially solving your your problem uh, but uh, you have to put a time limit or uh, let's say a resource limit uh, then uh, finding the, so the solution as quick as possible leads to the fact that you are uh, able to deliver in uh, especially in the applications a solution um, that is actually good enough for uh, practical purposes so i will speak about two uh, topics uh, that are around the use of machine learning for uh, um, heuristics in uh, MIP, and one is uh, learning to schedule heuristics uh, in uh, MIP and especially in um, uh, in Skip. And uh, the second one is uh, we're going to revisit uh, the local branching framework that uh, uh, Matteo Fischetti, uh, that is in the audience as far as I know, and myself have uh, um, uh, devised a long time ago, 20 years ago, uh, and looking at it by a machine learning perspective. So the first part is uh, um, joint work with uh, uh, some of my colleagues uh, at uh, um, both the University of Toronto, so Elias Khalil, and uh, at uh, uh, ZIB in Berlin, so Antonia 
Uh, Miela is, uh, I think, in the audience. I see her uh, passing, uh, the, her name passing. Uh, Ambrose Kleisner and uh, Sebastian Puput are the other co-authors. So this is uh, uh, the link to our, uh, or at least the information on uh, on uh, our technical report in the archive that is going to be appearing in uh, RIPS uh, 2021. So the the idea, the basis uh, of what we uh, I presented today about this is the is the fact that in uh, MIP. Uh, uh, solvers, uh, there are uh, uh, many, many heuristics that are being devised and uh, um, somehow the idea is that we wanted to find the best possible way of using those heuristics uh, within uh, uh, the solver in order to, as I said before, speed up the computation as much as possible. So let me remind you the, the context. So we're talking about the minimizing a linear function over a set of linear constraints, the binary variables for uh, uh, the purpose of this talk, but we can extend this to definitely it's not the requirement. Um, but for the, uh, let's say, for simplicity here, we're talking about binary variables. And uh, what we have, uh, I, I'm reminding you the, the, the framework uh, that we are, uh, the branch and bound framework that is implemented by all the solvers. So the first, uh, um, uh, the, the first idea is uh, that uh, um, you have uh, two trajectories that are leading uh, to the, uh, that have to essentially to touch uh, each other in order to prove optimality and uh, uh, essentially uh, finding, uh, solving uh, the instance that you want to, that you have. The upper trajectory, the red one in the picture, is the primal uh, um, trajectory. So you want to compute uh, solutions which are um, as good, I mean, uh, as quick as possible are, are, are good. And uh, the dual bound has to, so essentially means that we have to um, making it uh, going down. The value, we start by a higher value and then you going down, down, down until the, this trajectory, the right trajectory, uh, encounters the, the blue trajectory here in the picture, which is the one of the dual bound that we are increasing uh, over time. So uh, essentially, this is uh, when the two trajectory is, uh, uh, let's say, get together, then what we have is that we have a proof, proof of optimality. So the, um, this is obtained by, uh, of course, by analyzing a branch and bound uh, tree. So a, a tree uh, in which at every node we relax the integrality requirement, we solve the relaxation, and uh, we essentially constrain the relaxation by uh, branching on the variables, by adding cutting planes, by doing a bunch of different things. So um, uh, the, what we want to, to obtain is uh, uh, indeed uh, starting by the value of the LP relaxation, um, uh, we, we want to get uh, uh, the gap, which is the, the difference between the primal uh, solution and the dual solution, the best primal and the best dual solution uh, at any point in time, we want this to gap to be as uh, to be decreased uh, as much as possible, and uh, this is uh, uh, better primal bounds. Uh, we have more node uh, nodes which are pruned, and the gap uh, is closed faster. And on the other end, as we say before, better feasible solutions early, more effective decision making. Because at, if I stop at any point in time, then what I get is that I can, I get a, a, essentially a, a good solution to be delivered for application purposes. So um, now, uh, the one uh, good way of measuring the quality of uh, heuristics in within a branch and bound framework is the so-called primal integral. So the idea, the primal integral is the area below uh, the trajectory, the bit, I mean, from the optimum below the trajectory uh, that is the prime, the, the red trajectory in the previous uh, uh, slide. So uh, what this, if this area, if you are able to compute the optimal solution uh, immediately, then uh, the session the error will be zero. And maybe it, was, it will take some time to prove optimality, but at the same time, you have already, um, if you stop at any point in time, then the, the solution is already there. Um, on the other end, if the solution is obtained at a very late in the process, then the quality of what you're offering to the user uh, may be not particularly satisfactory. So if we reduce the primal integral as much as possible, then we win in this particular game. So now uh, we will use uh, over this uh, talk um, one problem that is actually difficult for uh, the, 
the primal perspective, which is to call it the generalized independent set problem. Um, the, in, uh, in this problem, we have a graph, uh, an undirected graph, and we so want to select a subset, uh, a subset of the vertices to maximize the uh, revenue. And um, we need to pay a cost for selecting adjacent a, a vertices. So the idea is that you, you have uh, um, essentially the uh, two uh, parts in the objective function. One part on the left is the revenue that I can get by selecting the vertices and on the right, on the right hand side, uh, the, on the negative side, so on the blue here in the picture, we have that if we are selecting um, two vertices which are connected by an edge in the graph, then we have to actually to pay a penalty uh, associated. So uh, this problem is difficult in the sense that uh, if you, uh, so the generalized independence problem is uh, challenging from the primal perspective because of this picture, you can see the blue uh, trajectory and this blue trajectory shows you that after four hours, for example, in this instance, which is not particularly uh, big, you are uh, not able to actually converge to optimality, but at the same time, the, 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 which is even worse, you are uh, um, essentially uh, 10,000 seconds here, but you are uh, also have a significant uh, uh, primal uh, uh, gap, but also a significant, uh, essentially, um, uh, how could I say, a significant uh, primal integral because it is the is the curve below, below is the area below the curve the the trajectory of the blue trajectory here in the in the picture. So we would like to, to do something to improve this. And uh, the, our idea is to do it uh, uh, in a solver, uh, in a context, uh, an environment that we know well, and uh, which is Skip. And uh, um, Skip uh, is, uh, as we all know, is one of the fastest non-commercial solvers for MIP. And uh, it's a very complicated object. And we will do some uh, implementation also using a, a, a library that is called uh, a call or an environment in which you can do uh, essentially um, um, try machine learning ideas in the context and connecting them to uh, indeed MIP solving. So uh, skip uh, this is a nice picture showing uh, how many uh, primal heuristics uh, there are uh, within skip. So all this uh, um, uh, yellow, uh, uh, let's say, uh, dots over uh, over there are all the uh, primal heuristics that you can use into sk in skip. And uh, in particular, we will concentrate on two types of primal heuristics, the diving heuristics. So uh, diving heuristics are uh, essentially uh, the, uh, all, these, all those heuristics that are actually doing some sort of, uh, um, um, say, fixing of the variables uh, re with some recomputation and uh, a fixing of the variables of a node, the one you solve the LP relaxation, and you can round the variables and try to see you can recover a feasible solution. Then uh, this goes to a really a rounding it completely the solution to iterative rounding in which you uh, round some of the variables, recompute the LP, and so on and so forth. There are 15 diving uh, variants in skip and um, those va diving variants are different rules for fixing the next variable for the round uh, the least fractional variable fixed variables in dense constraints many different things and they are uh, one important parameter is uh, the maximum number of iterations so the max diving depth that actually the heuristic is is using so um um, the idea here is that uh, we want to manage heuristics. So uh, in uh, Skip implements 57 uh, heuristics, different heuristics, and uh, some of them are effective on a particular node, on a particular uh, uh, problem, on a, uh, on a particular context, and some of them are essentially failing. So what does it mean fail? It essentially means that they are not able to, uh, they are run, but they are not able to find a feasible solution. So this is going to be, a, a, in a certain sense, everything time that uh, the heuristic is improving the solution, uh, you have uh, something good because uh, the, the primal uh, uh, integral and the primal gap are actually diminished. But if the, so the, the, the heuristic is failing, essentially you don't, you, you're left with nothing in the sense that you have invested some computing time, but nothing has happened. So um, there are uh, also um, and the managing heuristic means uh, two things, especially at the same time. Uh, not every heuristic has the same complexity. So in the sense of uh, heaviness, uh, 
uh, how heavy it is uh, in terms of the computation, so how much resources, time, essentially, it takes. And uh, so uh, um, it may uh, lead to a different situation in which you want to use heuristics in, uh, in different forms. So with the, um, depending on the, the problem that you're solving, you want to use them more or less, or every one of the heuristics has to have some sort of uh, um, a different uh, characteristics. So for example, the, the heuristic loop is the following. For each heuristic, uh, in a certain order of priority, for at most the max number of iterations, so that is actually associated with the specific heuristic, you perform one more step, which means that you give some additional resources to the heuristic uh, until a new incumbent is found and the loop is interrupted. Okay, so the idea is that there are two main uh, important uh, parameters that you have to play with. One is the order in which you are running the heuristics, and the other one is the maximum amount of resources that you are allowing to each one of those heuristics. So, um, of course, uh, these are two parameters. So the first thing that comes to mind is that you can do some sort of parameter tuning. And uh, uh, in this uh, parameter tuning, uh, you can um, essentially use uh, some uh, uh, automated configuration <clears throat> for uh, uh, mixed integer programming solvers, which have been uh, an, an active area of research since the beginning of 2010. There's a nice seminal work by Hutter, uh, uh, Oss, and um, Leighton Brown. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, of course, uh, this is actually one possibility, but uh, this possibility is uh, uh, somehow um, uh, 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 as limitations. So one, one thing is that you have to do black box optimization, which can be slow. And for our MIPS, uh, each evaluation may take hours because uh, essentially you have to collect a lot of data that is, uh, is going to be uh, difficult and time consuming to collect. And in particular, it doesn't not exploit the fine graded information about how parameters alter the solver behavior. So we would like to go a little bit deeper into the order of the, the, the parameters and the way in which the evolution of the of the branch bound itself. So um, uh, just to convince you that uh, these two parameters are very important, let me show you this picture. So this is actually two uh, different classes of problems. So one is uh, the generalized uh, independence problem that I already introduced, and the other one is fixed charge and multi-commodity network flow. Blue, the GISP, and the network, or the multi-commodity flow is actually in uh, yellow here. And as you can see, these are two different heuristics, uh, and uh, the, the solution, uh, this is success rate uh, that they are, uh, they, they are having. So, um, this means that uh, depending on uh, on the heuristic, uh, this, the success rate uh, can be very different. So each one of the of the bars, uh, of the pairs of bars, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, a heuristic. And as you can see, for example, the first one is uh, uh, is very good for both uh, uh, GISP and uh, uh, multi commodity network flow. But for example, if I look at the fourth or fifth. Uh, uh, it's very good for uh, uh, network flow, but it's actually not particularly effective for uh, uh, GISP. So essentially, this means that uh, if I, um, I uh, depending on the class of problems that I'm, uh, I'm um, trying to solve and uh, I'm trying to schedule heuristics for, then the order in which I run the heuristic can have a significant uh, uh, impact. On the other hand, also the maximum number of iteration matters. So you can see three different uh, evolution of heuristics here the, in terms of percentage of solution found. As you can see that uh, this depends on the number of iterations in a very uh, different way. So the green heuristic that you can see at the beginning is finding solutions uh, very quickly, but then uh, for uh, uh, in the first, let's say, 100 iterations, and after that, there is nothing more that can be added. Uh, different is the yellow one, and even different is the, is the blue one uh, in the evolution over uh, the number of iterations. So essentially, this tells us that there are some heuristics that should be run with a limited number of iterations, because after a certain amount of iterations, they will very rarely converge to find the feasible solutions. So now, uh, putting all this together, so there are uh, 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 MIP 
uh, is challenging on the primal side. So you would like to actually improve the work of the MIP solvers in finding a feasible solutions. The distribution over the instance uh, may uh, change quite a lot of the situation uh, depending on, uh, for example, uh, the order in which you want to run the heuristics of the demo, how much, uh, how many iterations uh, you want to run them. The long, uh, there are long solver times, uh, which uh, I mean somehow uh, makes uh, uh, complicated the, the situation uh, in terms of uh, running, uh, um, uh, sol running, uh, let's say, uh, black box optimization in order to do parameter tuning. And finally, we would like to have something. Uh, I mean that is uh, um, uh, that is not a heuristic that is developed for a particular problem every time, but we want to have something that use that is used in general for skip. So, um, the, uh, in order to do that, of course, we, the a natural idea is to try to use machine learning. So, which means uh, collecting data and, uh, in a certain sense, uh, try to find the good compromise between these uh, uh, situations. And uh, then uh, you, it's easy to see here that uh, in this uh, uh, these are three different nodes uh, performance and this is the number of iterations so or uh, specific iterations that for three mm, three different heuristics um, the heuristic are indicated with a different color and the nodes are so three for each one of the three nodes and uh, mm, these are three different nodes in the branch and bound framework and then the question is uh, how do i need to schedule heuristics in this case and the best situation for us is something like this so uh, the yellow heuristic is the one that i would like to run first for limited number of iterations one iteration only because if it finds the solution it finds it immediately after that there is nothing to do and then the second heuristic is the one that we want to run for three iterations because it will actually not be paying anything for the first node because already the first one has found the feasible solution and you recall that uh, once uh, uh, one of the heuristics finds a feasible solution then we, st we stop, the, the, the entire loop is stopped and after three iterations there is guarantee that this is actually going to find a feasible solution both for node 2 and node 3. So this is actually in this particular case the optimal schedule that we want to apply and we were going to find a feasible solution for the three different uh, nodes. Now, how do I do this computation? So I'm collecting data and then I'm doing training and uh, particularly I run the solar solver on training instances, then I execute the heuristics very aggressively collecting performance data. We will see in a second what to do. We combine the data and we solve the scheduling problem. So the scheduling problem actually can be formulated as a mixed integer quadratic optimization problem. That would be too much, uh, let's say, time consuming to solve that problem in that form, even offline. And actually, uh, and so we are going to do it by a greedy heuristic, which is uh, largely inspired by the PhD thesis of uh, Matthew Streeter. And uh, in the particular, in the implementation of the co data collection part is uh, uh, again, uh, similar or inspired by the work of uh, Elias did uh, um, long ago, I mean, a few years ago in 2017 uh, for uh, um, uh, associated with the idea of, uh, let's say, uh, I, uh, running the heuristics, uh, um, the primary heuristics in, uh, in, uh, in a mode, in a, let's say, uh, hidden mode. So it means that you're running the heuristic, you every one of the heuristic, and you are not, um, if the heuristic finds a feasible solution, you're not updating the uh, solution itself in such a way that uh, the, uh, you can collect the information of each one of the heuristic, the, the, the rate of success of each one of the heuristic. Uh, we can do parallel data collection. We have one solver run per instance. So we solve the scheduling problem in this, uh, which is a, a strongly MPR with this grid heuristic, and we put all this, this, this together. And uh, uh, at uh, the test time, uh, once we have done the entire, uh, uh, let's say, uh, we've done the entire uh, training uh, uh, offline for the for the for the for a class of problems. Then we run, uh, we modify skip in the sense of the order in which and the number of uh, iterations that each one of the heuristic has to run. And uh, essentially, we run skip as it is. So we are not doing any other modification and uh, 
uh, this is uh, on the left hand side of the slide you can see for the fact that there are uh, every one of the heuristic has a different color has a different number of iterations which is the the width of this box and um, uh, skip is uh, is run in this form so there is no additional uh, let's say computing time that is needed for uh, for finding uh, the order or uh, uh, anything else so now um, this is uh, what we achieve uh, in terms of again com coming back to the uh, generalized uh, independence set problem uh, what we have is uh, um, uh, in the primal integral, uh, I go back to that slide and then I show you that the, this is uh, the trajectory of the scheduled heuristic. So in the, the trajectory, the yellow trajectory is showing that there is a significant improvement in the area that is below. Uh, the, the trajectory of the of the heuristic and uh, in particular if I go to the aggregated results I can see that the default skip I can I can make a, an improvement over 33% uh, uh, reduction of the time best solution and 49% reduction over the average primal integral these are uh, 240 instances the train we train on small ones we test of the um, instances which are three times larger and the which means that the good news is that the the machine learning approach that we are applying here generalizes well to larger instances um, so this uh, right columns also tells us that it's strictly better primal integral on 92 percent of the cases so the our framework really uh, pays off um, the, uh, from, from a quant qualitative perspective, you can see the scheduled heuristic uh, uh, pictorially on top versus the default one. In the default one, the heuristics are run for the same number of iterations in skip, while uh, as you can see that the, the size of the box, the width of the boxes shows that uh, our heuristics are actually selected, the number of iterations is selected in a quite a different way. And you can also see that the, also the order is quite different for us. Um, let me wrap up things and say that uh, uh, the, uh, by doing a comparison, so you can use a SMAC, which is um, uh, a comparison to, I mean, essentially it was one of the strongest uh, uh, parameter tuning framework that you can use, uh, um, that you can use. and uh, um, SMAC uh, directly optimizes the ideal metric, which is uh, the primal integral, while in our approach, I didn't really spend too much time, but what we are optimizing is uh, uh, in a certain sense, uh, the rate of success of finding feasible solutions for the heuristics, which is, of course, only a proxy because uh, you can find feasible solutions, but maybe those solutions are not improving versus uh, the, the current one. Still, uh, SMAC barely matches uh, our method uh, in terms of quality of the solutions, and it takes uh, uh, often two orders of, maxi of magnitude more time to do the entire computation offline. So uh, 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 wrapping up, uh, we have a single comprehensive framework for managing heuristics. This can be uh, retrained for each one of the class of instances that you want. This is extensible to, uh, uh, I mean, in this particular case, we applied it to uh, um, in the paper to diving heuristics and to heuristics, uh, local search heuristics. Uh, but uh, I mean, this can be applied to arbitrary heuristics uh, in uh, skip or uh, wherever you want. And it's quite fast to train and use uh, uh, at test time. Again, this is the link to the paper that uh, we wrote about it. So let me switch to the second uh, uh, topic that I wanted to cover today. And this is going back to one of my, uh, let's say, first uh, uh, paper or contributions uh, to the area of, uh, definitely the first one to the area of uh, uh, primal heuristics. So this is a joint paper with Matteo Fischetti and uh, um, published back in 2003 in the mathematical programming. And this was the first paper uh, um, um, essentially to uh, propose to explore large neighborhoods, uh, large neighborhoods uh, directly through a MIP, box, uh, MIP uh, call, so using MIP as a black box uh, for this. Um, we are revisiting now the paper, the, the paper and the, the contribution of local branching uh, through a machine learning uh, perspective, and uh, this is actually joint work with uh, Feng Liu, that is my student in, uh, in Montreal, and again, Matteo. 
as uh, uh, with uh, with us in this uh, uh, enterprise so let me remind you what uh, local branching is about so the idea is uh, is uh, um, uh, sketched in the in the right hand side of uh, this slide so we are still thinking about uh, uh, a mixed integer uh, linear optimization problem with binary variables. The binary variables are important for us in this particular context because we will define uh, the so-called binary support of an initial solution. So we start with one solution, which is on top in this picture, x1 bar, and we say that uh, we can, considering the binary support, so the variables which are set to one in this solution, we can um, add a single uh, invalid, of course, inequality to our original MIP and say that we don't want to change too many of the decisions uh, associated with this particular uh, solution. So we're saying that, uh, so the, 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 the first term in, this, uh, in, the, in the constraint that is on the bottom of our slide says how many variables are switching from zero to one in uh, uh, the, um, in the new solution that we want to compute, while the second uh, part of the constraint says how many variables are switching from uh, essentially from one to zero. So we count the number, the ending distance between uh, all possible solutions and the, the solution that we're starting from, so the reference solution, and we want, we, we fix arbitrarily this uh, this uh, number to k and we say that we don't want to we want to only consider uh, uh, solutions which are at distance maximum k from uh, from the solution that we have so now um, at this point uh, uh, what we have is that on the left we are exploring the the neighborhood obtained by adding this uh, as i said invalid constraint by just running our favorite mip solver on uh, the the, pro the obtained problem and if we are lucky we get a new but uh, improved solution x2 bar and we can uh, go to node number three and exploring the neighborhood now of x3 bar and continue like this so in the meantime if we want to keep this framework as an exact framework we can essentially we can revert the constraint that is uh, delta of x x bar less or equal than k saying that if i explore the two uh, optimality the neighborhood which has been uh, defined then i can just revert the constraint and then say that any other solution i care about must be at, at least k plus one bits away from the current solution so now uh, this is uh, the local what the, the original framework of the local branching and uh, mm, we have a slight uh, a variant uh, in um, in which called the symmetric form uh, which is the variant in which uh, uh, essentially we are just counting the number of uh, uh, binary variables which are switching from uh, one to zero and um, this is particularly useful for the problems in which for example we have a fixed number of variables that are in this in, in the solution for example the tsp so now uh, what do we um, what why this framework has been uh, uh, let's say somehow popular and uh, uh, and um, let's say effective. Uh, the first of the first is that there is a sort of integration between local search meta heuristics uh, uh, within uh, mixed integer programming solvers, as shown for the first time that we can explore uh, neighborhoods of larger size by just uh, running. Uh, a MIP solver as a black box and the scheme is quite flexible it is exact in nature even if of course has been used uh, and by ourselves uh, first as a heuristic in the sense that you can put a, a limit in the number of iterations that you are uh, number of nodes that you are exploring um, uh, in each one of these triangles in the in the picture and you can do plenty of uh, different variations in order to converge as quick as possible to best to good solutions and of course this has also been integrated into the MIP framework by running it on specific nodes on the branch and bound. However, now looking back, there are also limitations. So the default, uh, the first one is that the default value of k is fixed. So we, we actually, we did some preliminary experiments and we ended up to say that uh, k equal to 20 was actually a good number. And so we ran all our experiments in the paper with that value or with 10 if there was an asymmetric form. The distributions uh, over the instances is absolutely not taken into account. We don't do anything different for classes of instances which are different. 
And of course, uh, this is also true that we're not even uh, really take into account uh, what is the quality of the solution. We are just given a, 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 an initial solution in some form, and then we go for that, and we don't adapt K to that particular solution. So now, what happens here? So it happens that, uh, you can see in the two pictures on the left, is that the size of the neighborhood really matters. So the initial K, let's concentrate first on the initial K. As you can see in the, in the top uh, picture on the left, so this is the objective function evolution uh, depending on the neighborhood size. So R is between zero and one, means uh, R times N, the number of variables tells us uh, what is the size of, the, of K of the, of the neighborhood. As you can see that for a small size neighborhood, the improvement that we can get in the objective function is very limited, starting from one solution, that is one in this picture, so you're going down. Uh, of course, uh, the smallest neighborhood, the fastest is, this, uh, is uh, uh, its exploration. And uh, as you can see, at some point, of course, you can get much better solutions. But at some point, of course, uh, because every solution is there, so even the optimal solution is uh, uh, for a sufficiently large value of k. But the point is that it's going to take a lot of time to actually um, explore that particular neighborhood, and you cannot be uh, effective anymore. So we are shooting for finding this a sweet spot in which the neighborhood is easy to explore so fast but at the same time the improvement is significant on the quality of the solution and so we are shooting for finding this uh, um, k prime uh, k1 sorry that is uh, the first uh, uh, k that we want to solve in uh, in let's say in node number uh, uh, number two uh, by uh, indeed uh, using a particular value of k so how do we do that? Well, uh, of course, again, you can do black box optimization for this. So it's a, um, it's a performance, you define a performance function, which is the improvement, a MIP uh, instance, uh, um, a set uh, of values for K1. And the goal is to solve uh, this optimization problem uh, that you can see on the left, which is uh, K1 over this uh, set of possible value of K. And the, the objective function is to find the best uh, uh, essential improvement possible uh, based on the time limit that you have and, and the multiple things. This can be solved by black box optimization, model free methods. You can do grid search, uh, Bayesian optimization. The limitation will be that the function evaluation for each instance is very expensive and is not actually compatible to actually use it uh, online. So now, uh, the, our idea, our uh, suggestion is, uh, let's try to learn uh, to predict K1 through a regression task. So we do uh, data generation by solving a black box optimization offline. So the idea is to try grid search on uh, many values of K, fixing a, a time limit at the beginning. And we do the data generation as is shown in the upper part of the picture on the right. So you do the data generation, you do training, which is again a regression over the data. And uh, um, the parameterization uh, of the model, of the machine learning model will tell us uh, from the regression uh, model uh, what is the, the size of the predicted K. At that particular point, once we have predicted K, we run the local branching as it is, and we actually do uh, an evaluation, a comparison between what we are going uh, to achieve. Uh, the regression task is, uh, is easy to define. So if uh, uh, capital L is the loss function uh, of, the, of, the so of the solution uh, uh, F theta of I, uh, capital I um, the uh, obtained by the regression model over the optimal one, which is obtained by doing this uh, grid, uh, grid search. Uh, and then we take an average, of course, over the, the, um, the class of instances, set of instances. And, uh, but what is the model? So what is uh, theta here? So the model is uh, we're using a, a graph neural network, so a bipartite graph which is a byte uh, um, graph in which we have on the left the variables and on the right the constraints. And we have a connection between a variable and a constraint if the variable is actually present in a particular constraint. So we are capturing the structure of the problem by actually using this graph neural network. The graph neural networks have been used already multiple times to solve a machine learning, uh, let's say, tasks for combinatorial optimization problems. We have a paper. Uh, 
uh, on uh, uh, selecting the br branching uh, the variable to branch on in mixed integer optimization uh, that is was published in Eurips 2019. This is, was not the only time has been used extensively in many other contexts. So uh, does it work? Well, uh, uh, quite well in practice. So the implementation is in Python uh, using skip and again using a call uh, our uh, environment for uh, machine learning for uh, discrete optimization. We have a um, benchmark of set covering a maximum independent set. The first solution found we have two content, two different uh, initialization. One, the first solution provided by Skip, so computed by Skip. One, the other one is the best solution at the end of the root node in Skip. And we are comparing here the local branching baseline with the local branching regression. So just using regression for essentially for uh, uh, computing the first value for k for k. And as you can see, there is a significant improvement. Uh, in uh, so the, the table table four so the first one on uh, on the top here is uh, the average primal integral while uh, the average primal gap is given in the bottom table as you can see that in all contexts we are able to actually improve the uh, local branching baseline significantly by just uh, predicting the value of k1 and um, um, so after that uh, we switch back to the idea that uh, uh, that we're using a local branching exactly as was designed originally and we continue in, in the same form. So um, this is, uh, uh, however, only for the first value of k and uh, the, already the local branching uh, framework uh, in the original paper had some sort of adaptive uh, um, uh, application of k. So depending on the fact that the, the heuristic uh, uh, the, 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 the solution of those triangles uh, was actually effective or not, we could reduce the size of K or increase in the size of K, uh, in, let's say, uh, dependently of the success. And uh, what we have been trying to do is to, again, connecting these two data and doing this in a, um, a Marco decision process type of approach by implementing a reinforcement learning framework. And uh, we are, um, so now on the top, we have the prediction first value of K and on the bottom, we have the evolution of the, of the local branching in which now there is this uh, red box, which is on the bottom, which is the reinforcement learning approach, which is online deciding how to change the, the framework. Of course, again, this is connected with having a lot of data and try to, to, to train uh, over this and then using the policy at uh, runtime. But as you can see, uh, the, the, the Marco decision process idea is quite natural. We have state space with the set of uh, um, solutions, uh, uh, state, uh, the status uh, uh, solution of local branching heuristic. Uh, as you can see the, the, on the, on the uh, top right uh, picture, you have four different uh, stat statuses which are optimal. So it's solving the neighborhood to optimality, infeasible. Uh, not improved into the time limit or improved into time limit. Improved into time limit means that I'm solving the submit uh, uh, in time limit. I get into time limit, but uh, I improved the solution. Not improved. I, I run into time limit, but I didn't improve the solution. So uh, the blue line here splits into submit solved and submit unsolved. So time limit has been reached. The 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 red dotted line is splits into uh, the objective uh, uh, function is improved or the objective function is not has not improved so the action space is uh, uh, simple so we essentially uh, increase a step uh, by a step a k step uh, the uh, value of k or we leave it as it is uh, we decrease it or we reset it to the initial uh, original value and the policy um, uh, pi uh, maps a state to one of the four options before while re, um, gaining a reward, which is uh, the improvement of the objective function times the, the time uh, um, spent in uh, essentially exploring the neighborhood, which takes into account both perspectives. So the improvement, but at the same time, as we've shown in the original uh, framework, the, the idea of how to use the time uh, wisely. So um, these are uh, some preliminary results. We have much more. Uh, uh, into uh, both uh, uh, AAAI submission that is currently evaluated and uh, in uh, recent uh, uh, work, 
uh, that we are uh, finalizing in order to submit to uh, potentially to a journal. So as you can see here, uh, still the reinforcement learning by using uh, some uh, basic algorithm for uh, learning, which is a policy gradient method, is actually able to improve quite a lot. So the LB uh, regression uh, announced by the reinforcement learning approach, so the green dotted line, is able to actually improve uh, uh, significantly, so you get uh, a big improvement, of course, uh, with respect to the lower uh, local branching baseline, especially because uh, we are using the regression quite a lot. And then there is a 29% also improvement over the uh, the, um, uh, the, reg the regression model that is not using this adaptive way of uh, changing. Uh, uh, changing K uh, over time. Uh, the, most of the good news here in this framework uh, are on the fact that the generalization is surprisingly effective. So we are, I'm not, um, I didn't discuss this, uh, I don't have slides because of, uh, of a matter of time here, but uh, uh, I'm running really out of time, I think, but the idea is that uh, essentially the uh, we are, I mean, the, using a graph neural network means that this training has to be done differently for each class of instances. But we have been able, while the reinforcement learning is not trained on, uh, um, I mean, is not using uh, information associated with the class of instances, but just using uh, the evolution of the framework itself. So the signal given by the possibility of solving or not solving each instance and um, each, uh, uh, let's say, neighborhood. But the good news is that we have been able to actually um, train on a very heterogeneous uh, set of instances, zero one instances, uh, and it seems that the performance that we have obtaining are extremely good, which is uh, uh, good, very good news for us. So um, let me uh, draw some simple and quick conclusions. Uh, I believe that the amount of opportunities for using uh, ML into mixed integer optimization is, uh, is quite high. Uh, the mean solvers are connections, uh, collections of uh, algorithmic ideas, some of which are very heuristic, and uh, this can be clearly benefiting from using data and learning quite a lot. Uh, we are only at the beginning of, the, of, of this road, and the challenges are many, but um, this looks promising to me. Uh, the challenges are mostly on the use of uh, the right metrics uh, in order to make sure that uh, what we are obtaining is uh, is correct and is actually is an improvement of what we have already. And let me just uh, uh, tell you that uh, a call, so the framework that we have, uh, uh, that my team in Montreal has, uh, has developed in terms of uh, uh, machine learning for, uh, let's say, combinatorial optimization. So this environment uh, in which you can implement your uh, ideas by using, by interfacing with Skip, collecting data and running your uh, let's say, um, learning tasks uh, has been the subject of a uh, uh, NeoRIPS uh, 2021 competition that as I think that the ending date was actually yesterday. Uh, so there's no, no time anymore for, uh, for doing uh, this, but still I think it was, uh, I want to point out that uh, this is uh, something that is uh, try to bridge the communities, uh, machine learning community with uh, the combinatorial optimization community, giving an environment in which ideas can be um, can be uh, used uh, and can be tried very, uh, very uh, quickly, and uh, the, uh, the um, let's say the data can be collected and used um, and reused by different authors is very important. There were three tasks in this competition: primal task, similar to what I described it today. If you want a dual task in terms of improving the dual bound and configuration task was the last one. So. Um, uh, that's it for me, and uh, I'm happy to take any uh, questions that you that you have. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. It was very, very, very nice presentation. So, um, for the audience, um, if you raise your hand, um, then we will um, give you um, say the rights to uh, share um, your video and your um, uh, micro. So, are there any questions in the audience? Yes, so Jan, um, Christina is going to give you uh, yeah, the rights um, and then you can uh, pose your quest the question yourself. 
Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, Andrea, for, for the presentation. I think that the question I have is more at a high level, when you describe the data and find an embedding for a problem, uh, how much of it is actually features about the instance you sold and how much of it are features about the node itself and when you are in the solving process. And my second question would be um, also, you're, you're looking at specific you know, class of problems. So in some way, you don't need to have a good encoding of the, of the problem instance because you know, you're only giving problems that have a similar structure, so to say. And so uh, what are your thoughts on how you could encode the structures? So you could have a, a strategy maybe that is more agnostic to the type of problem structure you're dealing with. Uh, both questions are very, uh, very uh, interesting and very, of course, uh, let's say very punctual. So this is, let me start by the second one. So the, this is about generalization. So as uh, I try to touch it, uh, uh, of course, it's a big topic. So in, uh, uh, in the first problem, so in the, in the scheduling of heuristics, uh, this has been uh, really designed to, let's say, collect data and uh, generalize to larger sizes, but not uh, try to generalize really to, uh, to, the, um, to different classes of problems. Because, uh, uh, first of all, uh, um, the effect of heuristics uh, really depends also on the difficulty of the problem that you are solving. So essentially here, the, the, we have a situation in which uh, um, I mean, in those two classes of problems that we have taken into account, the primary solution is actually difficult to find. There are multiple uh, classes of instances in which doing some type of work uh, when uh, um, skip or uh, your favorite MIP solver is actually finding solutions very quickly, it's probably not paying off very much. Um, the second one in the local branching, uh, surprisingly, as we say at the end, the generalization is working uh, very, very well. So we can see that the first part K1, the computation of K1 is, uh, can be improved by uh, using, a, uh, by using a graph neural networks uh, and really tailoring this over the class of instances that we want to solve. But we have seen that, um, uh, maybe not so surprising because uh, even K equal to 20 fixed value was working <laughs> relatively well in the original paper. But we, what we can see is that training or a, a completely homogeneous, uh, heterogeneous uh, um, set of instances uh, uh, was actually is quite effective uh, in the sense that um, overall we have been obtaining a, a very good results with a small deterioration versus uh, uh, versus, uh, let's say, training on uh, homogeneous class of instances. Um, about the embedding, so the first part of the questions, I think part of it I already answered uh, by the generalization thing. Uh, my impression is that the data is, uh, of course, uh, very important. So we have to uh, take that into account uh, uh, very much. And still, uh, I mean, that's the part that we're exploiting the most. Uh, the nodes are... Uh, uh, yeah, looking different one from the other, but uh, if uh, we want to go so much uh, uh, particularly into taking into account node by node, that will be too hard, in my opinion, and will be disrupting uh, the um, overall framework of uh, um, uh, skip. So you have to find the right compromise between saying, okay, yes, maybe there is more information related to this particular node, so we can do better. But on the other end, then they will require much more online computation, which we don't want to do it. Because again, asserting how difficult it is, uh, uh, each one of the nodes is uh, uh, difficult in itself. Thank you very much. I hope uh, it answers your question. Yeah, thank you. So, Nagisa, um, yeah, we are going to give uh, you the rights. Just a um, second. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Ah, uh, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. I really like the topic and I'm really exciting, I thought. Um, my question is very simple. Um, I was thinking about the second graph neural network thing, and uh, I was very surprised with the fact that the training instances are very small, like namely like we only had uh, 200 instances for like training and evaluation and test. And uh, I was wondering like, is this because the 
like uh, instances are small or like a neural network is small, can train with this small number? Well, the number of instances is small, but the number of data points is large because we actually huh. try with every size of k at the beginning, so going from very small to very large. So we can collect a lot ah. of data points or even in a small number of instances. So that is, I think, is the trick that we are applying in this particular case. So it's not one instance, one run, but is one instance, many, many runs. And so this leads to the fact that we have enough data to learn, in my opinion. Ah. Uh -huh. It's like, uh, how much, how, how large is the instance and uh, how much time did you spend for the training, if you remember? Uh, well, it's actually quite fast. Uh, the training uh -huh. part is a relatively fast uh, process. Uh, the, the mo uh -huh. Most of the training, uh, it depends on uh, solving uh, those uh, instances and actually i i didn't say it explicitly it's a good uh, thank you for the question for make me uh, giving the possibility of saying this so mo the results i presented today is uh, with using a local branching in a uh, restricted for a restricted amount of time so the idea is to integrate it into a larger uh, let's say framework that is not running a uh, local branching as a standalone so it's one uh, um, minute and every every single iteration is up to uh, 10 seconds so potentially is a small number of calls so what it takes time is collecting data so running all these options with different sizes of k but then once you have this data the the the, the neural network uh, that we are using is relatively simple and we are not uh, um, the training is actually in the order of uh, let's say uh, one hour at most so we're not really ah, like and we're not strong. running it uh -huh. over uh, really uh -huh. big uh, big architectures or anything like this it's mm -hmm. relatively simple ah thanks thank you nagisa thank you andrea uh, are there any other questions in the audience well, feel free to reach uh, out to me. I will be happy to discuss any one of those uh, offline in case. Okay. So if there are no more questions in the audience, then we would uh, like to thank uh, Andrea for making time today to come. And we will see you next week uh, with another of uh, our um, seminars. Thank you very much to everybody. I see Emilio. Bye bye. Bye, Emilio. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank bye. you so much for the invitation. Bye. bye. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Ciao. Ciao. Bye.